Um, thank you very much, and thanks, Glenn, for putting me on the graveyard shift. I, do you really hate the Irish that much, is it? And I was listening, to, I, I'm not on Twitter, Sam, but it reminded me, I have a seven-year-old uh, nephew, and uh, it's coming up to his birthday, and I'm his godfather, and I said, what, what would you like for your birthday? And he said, a pet spider. Pet, yeah, I thought the same. So I went down to the uh, local pet shop, and they said, we can give you a spider. I said, how much is that? He said, that's 70 euro, 50 quid. I said, forget it, you can get what's one much cheaper on the web. So, uh, anyway. okay, yeah, so you're still awake, obviously, all right? <laughs> okay, so this is what uh, I'm going to talk about for the next three and a half hours, is it? Is that what it got? Yeah, okay. Um, so, what, why do we need standards? And I, I'm going to show you a little video, I'm sure some of you have seen it, seen it before, but it, it shows you what can happen if your standards, communication standards, aren't correct. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? Okay. So, very important that you get your communication. And actually, that reminds me of a story. I was at a hospital dinner fairly recently, and I was sitting beside a guy, and I said to him, what do you do? And he said, brain surgeon. I said, that's fantastic. I said, how many brains have you surged? Uh, so we, we had a very quiet dinner a after that one. Okay, so... This is where, where I work and where the team that I work with, what we do is we manage patients with a condition called hemophilia. Uh, the incidence of hemophilia is the same worldwide. So in Ireland, we have approximately 2,000 patients that have some form of a, a bleeding disorder. 200 of those need intensive treatment, and that's mainly medication and self-medication in the home. And the budget for 200 patients is 45 million euros, so it's a really expensive drug. And as I said, the, the majority of these patients are required from birth that the parents will medicate them or they will self-medicate. Um, so, as I said, it's a chronic disease, and that's the incidence. It mainly affects males, uh, but the females are the carriers. But, as I said, it's e quite easily treated in one way in that you prepare a clotting factor concentrate. Previously, it was prepared from blood, that you would pull a lot of blood, create plasma from that, freeze dry the plasma, give it to the patients, and what that did was replace, and what that does is replace the missing protein in your body. So this is the science bit, and I'm showing you this because I can, because I'm a medical scientist in hematology. And what I've circled there is factor eight and factor nine. You may have heard of those. So we all bleed into our joints all the time. Um, but our, our bleeding stops like that because once you ble bleed either externally or internally, then it sets off a chain reaction of proteins activating another protein, activating another protein, until you get down to the clot formation at the bottom and the clot stops. These patients are missing these two, either factor eight or factor nine. So once the cascade gets down as far as here, then it doesn't get any further. So if a child bites their tongue, for example, they will continue to bleed and continue to bleed. And children bleeding their, uh, uh, biting their tongue is very common, but you would never normally notice it because the bleeding stops very quickly. But that's very distressing for a child who's hemophilia who's not being treated. This photograph shows you the effects if, if you don't treat it. These children are from Bosnia who, who don't have the same access to the healthcare system that you have here in the UK and that we have in Ireland. And as you can see, their knees are, are already showing the signs of hemarthrosis, which is bleeding into the joint. So their quality of life and, uh, is, is going to be affected. So they could very well end up uh, in a wheelchair. If they got the medication in time, if they took, took it prophylactically, they could live a, a normal life. There are different ways that um, how we get the medication and how, how the care is delivered to the patients. It, it, it varies from country to country, but basically what happens is the, the medication is prescribed by a physician. Um, they either come to the clinic and get it or it's delivered to the, to the patient's home. 
or they collect it at the pharmacy. So why am I talking to you today? Well, as you heard this morning uh, about the MRSA in, in, the, uh, in the, the treatment for the, the patient who had cancer, you know, these things don't happen. You never get funding for anything in Ireland anyway in the healthcare system unless there's a crisis. So you, you had a champion this morning because there was a crisis and that changed his life and he decided I need to do something about it. In Ireland and around the world, what happened was this magic bullet of, being, of patients being able to self-medicate in the home. The product became infected with HIV and hepatitis. It got into the supply chain. We did know where it was. We thought we knew where it was, but we couldn't find it. And product that was meant to be recalled was on shelves, was given, were, it was given out to patients who were subsequently infected with HIV and hepatitis. So we, we had a lot of deaths in Ireland. We had a lot of deaths around the world from it. In Ireland, that led to a tribunal of inquiry. So they went through all the facts of what happened, how it happened, how it could be prevented, and they come up with a number of, of recommendations where, which are very straightforward. We need to, the treatment centers, like all hospitals, need to talk to each other. And we must ensure that the, this medication that the patients are getting is of the highest quality. And so that was our business case. That's where we got the money. So it's crisis management as usual. And I think it's the same here in the NHS. And there also, it was, it was mentioned there earlier that there are diseases that are, are um, popular diseases. And that, that's true. Haemophilia was a popular disease because they threw money at it to try and solve it. Then another crisis comes along with HIV and hepatitis. And then you have another crisis and then you get more money for that. So that's unfortunately how, f how funding and how finance is usually uh, allocated. So the issues that we had is that we didn't have, the paper record was all over the place, wasn't accessible at night, the medication didn't have a, a product code in it, and the patients used to ch collect the medication, it was sent by train or parcel post, and sometimes it was left and not discovered for a week in somebody's shed, which led to wastage. And it's an increased risk to the patient. And as was talked about this morning, and generally, the, the care delivery was from the top down. OK, so using this business case that we had, we decided we needed to redesign it and put the patient at the center and build the system around the patient according to their needs. Luckily, when we started in 2003, 2004, GS1 were getting into healthcare, so we were able to leverage what they, were, what they could provide. We also uh, built a, a haemophilia-specific electronic patient record, which can be used around the country. We moved away from the ad hoc delivery service and contract a, a company who specialize in medication delivery to take the medication for us. And also, as I'll come on to later, we allow the patients, we have given the patients a app that they can download onto their phone um, to scan the medication before they take it. And of course, we also need to track and trace the medication as it moves through the hospital. But the key to this then is, is encrypted message to integrate it and then use best practice validation where possible to make sure that you're giving the best care possible. So just briefly on the electronic patient record, because it might be of interest to you here, it's, it's hosted in St. James's Hospital, but it's accessible in all the treatment centers around the country that will treat patients, but also the treaters have access to it in their own homes. That's very important for hemophilia because it's such a rare disease that you have junior doctors who are not sure what the difference between factor VIII deficiency or factor IX deficiency, and we've had incidences where patients with factor VIII deficiency were given factor IX and vice versa. That won't, it won't kill them, but it'll prolong the time till they get the proper treatment, and it's very expensive wastage of medicine. So I'm going to really talk to you about the supply chain and, and how we dealt with that. So our medication would come from the manufacturer. It would go to our Irish Blood Transfusion Service Board. From there, it would go to the hospital, and there, it would go to the patient home. And that's, that's the system it was. Unfortunately, it was paper-based. So if you needed to look up something, if you needed to recall something, you had to go through reams of pa paper. You had to go through books uh, that were on the wards. So it wasn't very efficient. So part of this project, we decided we would redesign the supply chain. 
And what we did was, we, we, as I said, we added in a cold chain supplier, and also the patient said, look, we want to make sure that our medication is safe to take. We, they were a very well-informed group of patients, because many of them are many of their, uh, their friends, are many of their family members, because it's a her hereditary disease, would have died from getting medication that was tainted. So we put it all together, um, and it would have worked like that. We could have got the medication from the manufacturer to the cold chain supplier, to the hospital, to the patient home, to the patient, and it would have worked quite well, but there was a piece missing, and luckily for us, as I said, GS1 were getting into this space. So by using a GS1 barcode on the medication that the manufacturer applies, gives it to the cold chain supplier, who can scan it then to the hospital, it can be scanned to the patient's home, and then finally the patient can scan it themselves. So, by scan, 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 there, that what you're doing is you're tying up the whole process. So um, what we were doing, what we wanted to do, and what GS1 suggested is that we wanted to adopt the retail model for track and trace. In Ireland, we're, we're, we're very proud of the fact that you can trace our beef from farm to fork. Um, you couldn't, you couldn't do that with medication. But I just thought last night when the, uh, when the keynote speaker was talking about the, uh, the horse gate, I, I just thought it gives a whole new meaning to my little pony, you know, so I thought that was quite, that was quite interesting. So what we've done then is we uniquely identify the patient using a GS1 identifier. We uniquely identify the medication using the uh, GS1 identifier, the GTIN. And then every location where that medication is going to, it could be the hospital, the home, the local pharmacy, or even the transport van that has been scanned out of it and scanned into, is uniquely identified with a, a, G, a GLN, which is a, a GS1 identifier. So this is what, G, this is, I think, sums up GS1 very well. You identify the medication, so you identify it once. All manufacturers use a standard identification, so it's not proprietary, so you can use one system to track and trace the medication. You capture it once in the hospital or in the home, but then you can share it. You can share it with the patient, which we, which we do, and you can share it with the cold chain supplier so that they can keep their stocks up, and you can share it with the clinician because we also want the clinician to have a record of what the patient has received and when they've received it. So identify, so what, what did we need? When we started this journey, we went to the manufacturers and we said, look, this is what we need on the, on the, on the product. Now, it took a lot of lobbying. Some manufacturers still won't do it because they have a monopoly on the medication uh, that the patient's getting, so they, they have nobody else that we can play them off against. But any of the other manufacturers, when there's two or three involved that supply the medication, and you say, we want this, then when it comes up to tender time, you can be sure that they'll be contacting you, asking you how, how they can help. And we need to capture it. So we have identified it, so we need to capture it. We need to either capture it in the hospital, if a patient comes in for an inpatient procedure, such as maybe a hip, or even a dental procedure, which, which can, they can, patients can bleed quite a lot if they don't have their medication. And as I said, in the home. So in the hospital, we have built a software system that tracks and traces the medication as it moves through the hospital. And in the home, we have an app for the patients that they can scan their medication. TCP are a cold chain logistics company. Uh, they specialize in low volume, high, high uh, cost medication, and they also do home care as well. And they have integrated the GS1 standards and the process for capturing those into their warehouse management system, which allows them to accept the medication from the supplier, bring it through the supply chain to the patient. But if that medication doesn't have a GS1 identifier when they get it, their system will generate a GS1 identifier, overlabel the medication, which we don't want, really don't want to do, but we have to do, but then they can still uh, move it through the supply chain. So how does it work? So it needs, to get the, it needs to get to the patient in the hospital. So we are able, we get the delivery from TCP uh, to the hospital and they scan the medication from their van into the hospital blood transfusion fridge and it's scanned out of that fridge and then into an inpatient or an outpatient fridge. And from there then, it's issued to the patient. And when it's scanned to the patient, we can, we can check the uh, prescription against the medication. And if it's incorrect, they get an alert to say, you need to use another medication. It's then prepared, given to the patient. And here's the clever thing, when you're sharing it, 
clinical information and also what the patient took can go to the electronic patient record, but stock control information, stock was used, can go back to TCP, who can use that then for forecasting and then can, you, then can talk to the, the providers, the uh, suppliers, to say we need more stock. Now, sharing. So anybody that's worked in a hospital, particularly any of the nurses, you, 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 you know that, Sam, don't you? Yeah, that's, um, that's the scary thing that you would do if you were issue, issuing a blood product. So if you needed to do a recall, that's what you would use. Now, also manufacturers use this lovely trick when they're doing batch numbers of using ones and L's and zeros and O's. So when you're trying to write that down or even enter it manually into a system, there's a delay in that, and I still work on call in the hematology lab, and some of our batch products don't, don't have the uh, a barcode on it, and you're there at four in the morning, and somebody is a code red, so you need to get the product quickly, and you're trying to type this in, and it, you know, it really just adds to the time, it adds to the delay that, that before the patient can get their treatment. So we've been able to move from that to this, that our hemovigilance hem nurse can sit in her office rather than going to the wards to see What's in, the, what's in the fridge, so she can get the name of the product, the batch number, when it was received, when it expires, and what the quantity is. So it's all there in real time. We can track each unit, even though it's a batch product, we use serialized numbers on the batch, so we can track a, a unique a single vial from when it was received into the hospital, who, who scanned it out of, out of the fridge, when it was scanned into NCHCD, which is the outpatient location, and then when it was given to the patient, so with full traceability, and that continues upstream as well from TCP. If we need to do a recall, we can do a recall based on a, a product or a batch number. So in this instance, if we wanted to recall the, the, this particular batch, T TCP, the company, can run a report in their warehouse management system and say, we delivered this product to all these people that are blanked out, and we delivered nine to St. James's Hospital, and according to our record, you use seven of them. So we can run a report then, and we can say, yep, we received nine, seven have been used, two are in the fridge, one in an outpatient fridge, one in an inpatient fridge. We can put a block in those so that if somebody tries to scan them, that it will say this product is recalled, and we can take it out of the fridge and quarantine it so it can be investigated to see if there's anything wrong with it. But as I say, most of our product goes to the patient's home. So how do we do that? Well, we can send an electronic prescription from our electronic patient record to TCP's warehouse management system. And from that, they, they use that to pick, pack, and deliver the medication to the patient. Because these patients will be getting a prescription for three months or four months or six months, depending on, and, on what they're getting. But all that is done using barcode scanning to the patient's home. The patient then, as, as it'll come on to, will scan, their, uh, scan the medication and information will go back to both the um, stock management system in TCP but also the electronic patient record. But the big thing for us and part of the tribunal, what, what the recommendations was we needed to be able to track and trace. So we can, we can do a recall of all hemophilia medication anywhere in the country within 10 minutes and find, we can find out exactly where every vial is, whether it's in the patient's home, hospital, in the van, on the way to, or even if it's going from one location in the hospital to the other. And that's the power of, of barcode scanning. So this is the sexy part that the patients like. So, uh, we developed, along with the patients, we developed an app that could be used on the smartphone. Uh, it was developed by a company called Crimson Tide, nice name, and uh, they, they are a UK-based company, but they have uh, an office in Ireland as well. And uh, so they took this on board, they listened to the specifications that uh, we wanted and the patients wanted, and as I said, this was designed with a patient fo focus group. And they said, look, we want it to be simple. We want to be able to move it through it quickly because you have parents that are going to be treating their kids. So they wanted to be able to do their scanning, make sure it's safe, give it to the kids and move on. Um, and how it works is very simple. Every patient in Ireland with hemophilia has an ID card. And on that ID card, we have their unique identifier. So they scan that using the app. And what that does then is it confirms the patient's details. It confirms the treatment of choice, Advait. 
You can see they can, if it's a single user, they don't need to see that screen again, so that's one less screen they have to do. But if you have a parent with two boys with hemophilia, they may be in different treatment, so they will want to know it's the right child getting the right treatment. The next thing they do is they, they scan the uh, barcode on the medication, and that, that performs three very, very um, important safety checks, and we've just added another one in, but it, it checks the product details, in other words, the prescription, that it's the right product for that pa patient, that it's not expired, and that it's not on a recall list. Okay, so if it fails any of those, then they're, they're advised they shouldn't take it. We're also just adding a check for the patients that they can check to see if there's older stock in their fridge because we found that we were giving them the medication but they weren't, they weren't rotating the stock so they were just taking the, the box nearest them and we had some wastage due to that. But because we know the expiry dates, because it's on the barcode, we're able to give them another check to say, don't use that, use one that's going to expire before that. If it fails any of the safety checks, they get an alert that it has failed, but we also get an alert in the treatment center. If everything's okay, it, it gives them green for go, red for stop, as you may have seen. And if they are in a hurry to take the medication and the patients asked for this, they said, look, sometimes we just have to take it, but we still want to record it. So we added in a diary that they could retrospectively change the date, add it in, and then that meant that their, their treatment history was in chronolog chronological order. Some of the bleeds that patients have, even if they're taking it prophylactically, they can take it prophylactically. For ITT, that's just to overload their system so that they, that they don't uh, react to the medication. Or for on-demand bleeds, which are unexpected bleeds, these would be considered high-risk bleeds. So if the patient, we ask the patient, why are you taking the medication? So they, they tell us using this screen here. If it's one of those bleeds, they get an alert, say, you, sh you need to contact us and we also get an alert in the treatment center. But they are aware that the treatment center isn't open 24 seven. So if it happens out of hours, we educate them that this is just an aid. This does not replace what they should do, breast practice, which is go into the A&E or go into the hemophilia ward in their, lo in their local hospital. But again, it shows you by, if they choose a bleed, that it, it triggers an alert. If everything's okay, um, they're, they're told to continue. If not, they get this alert. So once that is done, the, uh, all the information goes to a secure web application, and from there, it goes into the electronic patient record. This is what patients used to have to fill in when they were taking the medication to assure compliance. Compliance rates were less than 50%. Again, they, were, they had to su suffer the same thing with the batch numbers, and uh, patients just, they just found it really, really difficult. Now they can log on to a secure web portal, and they can view their own treatment history and manage their own, and help them manage their own, and say, look, I've had this number of bleeds in my left elbow. So, and studies, international studies show the people that are involved in their own care, their outcomes improve. So not only do they get a view of it, but this is our electronic patient record, and when they go in to see their, their uh, healthcare professional, they can just open up their electronic patient record, they can go into this screen, and they can see what treatments they've had over the last number of months, weeks, whatever. And then they can use that to help them do the patients need more treatment, less treatment, a different treatment. But it's all real-time data. So outcomes, and we talked about outcomes uh, earlier on. Um, since this, this product started, we, ha we haven't lost any of our medication, uh, and what I meant is due to it being outside the, the appropriate temperature. Um, before that, there was a lot of wastage uh, because it was left in a, maybe a train station before it was picked up, or in one instance, uh, the, per the patient wasn't home, so the driver put it, uh, the taxi driver put it in his shed and put a post-it note there's somebody from 3M here, isn't there? Uh, there was a post-it note, put it on the front door and, and, uh, and left, and um, it blew away. So the patient come, came home, said their treatment didn't arrive. They rang the treatment center. The records were all over the place. The treatment center sent more, me more medication. The patient used it. Then two weeks later, they went out to mow the grass to get the mower out, and there was the medication, which was, what, 50,000 euro, sitting wasted in, in their shed. 
no documentation errors because you're scanning. We were able to remove at least five, and this goes back to what Sam was talking about in finance. We think it's at least five million euro, but the finance department won't tell us how much it is. It's obviously more than five million euro, but uh, they, so they said, yeah, so they said, I, because I was giving this presentation, the finance director was there years ago, and I said, we've saved at least five million. He said, oh yeah, more than that. But he wouldn't say much more than that. So. Uh, um, We've been able to remove five million. That's five million every year that isn't that isn't being isn't being spent. Stock rotation from other hospitals. All hospitals in Ireland must hold one one um, uh, ampule of the medication in case a patient comes into that area. It sits in that local hospital fridge. It expires because nobody manages. But because TCP of visibility, they're able to rotate it to somewhere that is going to use it and give that hospital long dated stock. Again, it's the power of the barcode. And, and as I said, um, mock recall, we know where all the medication is all the time. So some more outcomes of the smartphone, which, which are really interested, and it's a lot of data, and I take what you're saying about outcomes again, but we're at the stage now where we're trying to, we need to start measuring these outcomes much more scientifically than we're doing, and I'm useless, I'd be useless at that, I have to say. But uh, we'll get some genius to do it, I'm sure. So um, real-time uh, real alert, as I talked about, timeliness of infusion. Patients should take the medication first thing in the morning. Our hemovigilance nurse was able to see a patient who was taking it last thing at night. That has two effects. First of all, if they take it last thing at night, then the, there's a half-life to this medication. So by the following morning, its effectiveness has gone down. So the following day, they're more pr prone to breakthrough bleeds. If they get a breakthrough bleed, they need to take the product on demand. If they take the product on demand, it costs more money. So the nurse was able to say to the patient, look, can you take it first thing in the morning? And he said, well, it's suited as a lifestyle to take it last thing at night. But again, working with the patient, we, he understood the value of the medication and we were able to educate the patient. Compliance, we had one mum who was giving her kids um, 2,000 units instead of 1,750 for ankle bleeds. She knew that 1750 was enough, but when the hemovigilance nurse spoke to her on the phone, she said, oh, I always did that. I've been doing that for years. It was handier for me because that's the vial size. So we were able to supply with different vial sizes that, had, that she was able to make up the right amount. So we got the additional savings. The patient still was getting the correct medication. Automatic compliance, they don't even know they're being compliant. What they do know is that they're, that they're checking to make sure their medication is safe to take. Compliance is, is high. It doesn't always stay at 90% because patients with chronic diseases have to live. And taking the medication is one of the biggest problems that studies have shown when patients with chronic diseases because they just find it a real pain. They know they have to take it. They, might, they, they, they may take it, but they won't always record it. Real-time alerts. Patient empowerment, which I've talked about, and um, again, when we were trialing this in 2010, 2011, in the first three months, we saved. Uh, we know for a fact we saved over 70,000 euro, which paid for the for the startup and uh, and development of the app. So where are we now? So the medication is coming from the ma manufacturer. It goes straight to TCP. The Irish Blood Transfusion Service is, is out of the picture. They didn't really want to know when we were doing it. It goes then either to the home or to, to the hospital, and then it's given to the patient. But the key to this is using a standard on the medication so that all our so software systems and the app that we're using can read it. So if we had a HIPAA barcode in some coming in and GS1 in the others, it would be a nightmare. So that's why we lobby for using GS1 standards. So what do the patients think? Because this is real validation. So, I mean, this was taken some time ago, but they thought the service of them getting their medication at home by a cold chain supplier, they absolutely love it because they, they don't have to worry about that. Um, privacy and confidentiality. The, the product is delivered to them in a non-marked van. It doesn't say TCP hemophilia care because the last thing they want is that visibility because everybody associated hemophilia with HIV and hepatitis from, from, the, from the past. So they're very happy with that. Uh, and the overall satisfaction, but of course there's always one. You know, there's always one. So 
what's next? So we, we've built, um, built an alert that, that, that is just going live now. Um, again, the nurses said, look, we don't know if a patient is scanning or not. We want to be sure. So there's an alert built in that if a patient doesn't scan every four days, it's meant to be scanning, we get, we get an alert and then the, the nurse can talk to them. We're building in a quality of life um, study for the patients that will pop up every six months to find out how they're doing, how they're managing their condition, what they think, how they think it could be improved. And then um, we have had tentative talks with other groups within our health service because this could be used for vaccines, orphan drugs, clinical trials, diabetes, you name it, any, any chronic disease that needs to be treated in the home. This could be used. This template could be used for it. Um, just briefly, the HSE, which is our department, was part of our Department of Health. They did do a pilot with vaccines um, that GS1 Ireland ran, and the pharmacists loved it because you could give an iPad, and and even the nurses going into schools or going in wherever, you give an iPad to them, they could scan, but they also could take the signature then on the on the on the pad, so you'd have signature the confirmer, confirming that that patient received that product. Um, and the pharmacists were very upset when, when the, the pilot ended because they, they thought it was of great value and they made savings, even though vaccines, there's not a large margin uh, on vaccines. Uh, they made recommendations based on that and basically they're the recommendations that anybody that uses barcode scanning would, would, would use. Uh, conclusions, well the conclusions speak for themselves but I, I know that um, um, these are the guys that, that benefit from it, okay? So there, there are patients, and in some cases, they're your customers if you're a provider. Um, these are the people that do the work. I, I'm lucky enough that I get to come to the, the middle of England to this lovely place to talk to you about it, but these are the people that really do the work. And you talked about the winning team, and you were, uh, remember when we spoke in Mexico, you said, look, it, it is really a team effort. So the team, oh, how did that get there? Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's the wrong slide. I, I, I have no idea how that happened. Sorry, sorry. Um, sorry. This is the winning team. Okay, so, and it's not, they're lovely frocks, but I'm not showing you that because of that. Um, we have our consultant hematologist who's there. We have our data manager. We have two hemovigilance nurses from St. James's, and then at the far end from the Children's Hospital. And then Einstein behind her is the app developer from Crimson Tide and director from TCP and the pharmacy, two pharmacists from TCP. So it really is what you say, you know, like you, you go fast, go alone, okay? And if you want to go long, go together. So if you engage with all the stakeholders and it's in their interest to do it as well, because as, as well as making money, they also feel that they're, they're part of this, this service. So when we go to them, it's much easier. If we need a modification, it's much easier to get them to do it. So thank you all very much for listening, and um, I don't know if you're, take, are you're taking questions. Sure. No, thank you.